one is about industrial hemp. And um, <clears throat> I just want to make sure that you guys are filling out your sheets again. And this is one that I learned a lot. Um, and we're doing a Facebook Live up here. So, oh. um, but I learned a lot about it. They had an open house this July summer. July 10th. Yes. So they did an open house. And uh, it was really neat that they had, uh, we were able to walk the field. And, and they bused us to, to the other area where they had the hemp. And, and how many people did you guys have? A little under 200. Yeah, so the community really came out and really supported, and and so, anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and let Melissa go ahead and, and introduce herself and and what she does, and she has some uh, moral support helpers in the back <laughs> that are here to help to answer questions and go from there. And we, like I guess, if we have people on Zoom, okay. so you don't have to, um, but this is, yeah. Okay. Just a heads up. It doesn't matter. Okay. I just Chris wanted a podium last time. Oh, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just, yeah. We'll just turn you this way, and then we can do both. Perfect. Okay. My name is <laughs> Melissa Nelson. Um, I am with South Bend Industrial Hemp. I brought along my husband Aaron, also with South Bend Industrial Hemp, and then my brother-in-law Richard, and we are. Or they are from the Great Bend community. I am originally from Colton. And then in the back and out here, I brought my parents. They came up for my birthday, which is next weekend. <laughs> and so I roped them into coming and listening to me talk. Yeah. So, <laughs> who doesn't love listening to me talk? <laughs> so, um, we are from Great Bend, Kansas. We actually farm just south of town. And in 2019, Kansas approved hemp to be grown in the state. And so we went ahead and applied for a license, and this is kind of our journey that. and our story, um, and where we're headed for 2021. So, for today, like I said, I just wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about our story. Everyone has such a unique introduction to him. Uh, it's a rapid learning curve, and so, you know, every day we are reassessing, making changes, um, evolving with the industry because it is such a rapid rapidly changing industry i do want to quickly discuss the differences between hemp and marijuana because so many people are unsure of that and a lot of the words get thrown around interchange interchangeably like weed and pot and things like that and they are most definitely not the same thing um, and so i just like to clarify for that I'll tell you about our 2020 season and then what we're projecting for 2021 or 2021. So a little bit about each one of the members of our team. Uh, like I said, my name is Melissa. Aaron is my husband. Um, I am a crop research scientist by trade. I graduated in 2013 <laughs> with my bachelor's degree from Fort Hayes. Um, I then entered into the field of crop research and then did my master's degree in 2016 virtually through Colorado State while I continued my research um, at a company out of Larned. And then at the end of 2018, um, with the, the push from my husband, um, I opened my own facility. And so I now have my own facility that, that I run out of our house. It marries, very, it marries very well with this industry that we're getting into. Um, and it's, it's been a treat to continue to learn about this new crop and, and what it can do and how it can work with them. So that's a little bit about mm -hmm. me. And I put that center picture in there because if you see me out on the farm, I generally have my phone up the whole time because I'm either on Facebook Live or Instagramming or I love sharing our story and what we're doing. Um, so that's generally the pictures that you see I'm up here doing this. So. <laughs> Uh, my husband, Aaron, fourth generation farmer, uh, Circle K Farms, which is just, when you guys go out to can equip, you, that's kind of the direction of our farm. Uh, we call him the idea guy. That's what Richard and I coined for him. Uh, he's always got good ideas. <laughs> he's always got ideas. Lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Richard and I weed out the good ones and which ones we can do, and that's it's a good team. Uh, we each bring different strengths to the table because I, there's no way I could come up with as many ideas as he does in a day. Like, I could in a week. Um, then we have Richard. Richard is also a fourth generation farmer uh, with Circle K Farms. He's the machine man. Um, any idea that Aaron comes up with or anything I want to implement, he can build it. Um, wow. You know, Aaron's very handy like that as well, but Richard's very good at designing 
Uh, he built a lot of the, the dryers and the specialty equipment that we have and we use for our hemp uh, operation. He's put that most, he's put that all together. So that's a little bit about us. Now, we can kind of discuss a little bit the differences between hemp and marijuana. And if you have any questions, um, this is a great place to interject those. Um, you know, I put peppers up here because that seems to be a very relatable topic for everybody. You know, you've got peppers in the grocery store under that section. And then you've got bell peppers and you've got jalapeno peppers. Those are two very different peppers but they're still both in the pepper family. That's very much how hemp and marijuana is. Uh, you have cannabis. And when people say the term cannabis, that can be marijuana or hemp, okay? What is that deciding factor is the THC levels in that plant. 0.3% is the arbitrary number that divides whether it becomes a hemp plant or it's turned a marijuana plant. The hard part about this industry they look the same, they smell the same, everything is the same until you take them to a lab and you get that analysis done. So that is kind of the challenge. Um, one of the main reasons we have all our licenses, because we're licensed by the state of Kansas to be able to grow hemp, uh, we carry that in our truck, um, because we <laughs> smell like we hot box in our truck. <laughs> 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 we're done working in the field, it sticks on your clothes and then you go into a, my stepdaughter's volleyball game, and it's like, oh god, my mom's all looking at me. Like, this is <laughs> So, 2019, I kind of we've learned to adapt to that, and it's been it's been pretty neat to see the community really rally around us. Uh, when we first started, we got a lot of uh, not great looks, and now people are very interested in what we're doing. So, it's been a neat evolution for that. Um, so, do you guys have any questions about the differences? So I, I guess I do. Is it is it the point three percent is in how you it's not how you grow it. No, that's it's just how you produce it, or it's how you extract it. That's just What's what in is grow? in it. They call them cannabinoids. There's twenty. There's twenty six different cannabinoids in the hemp plant, and that's your CBD that you guys hear about. CBG, CBN, CBA. There's twenty six of them. THC is also a cannabinoid. So it's just like a property of that plant. Okay. So and CBD so. and THC. I have a question. Two things. Yeah. THC is what makes it. Yep. Hard. Yep. Just a second. Just a second. Yeah. Oh. So THC and then CBD are different. Yeah. THC so, okay. is the psychoactive. Yeah. That's THC what is, is my the CBD. psychoactive cannabinoid. Well, my CBD oil talks about how much T if it's THC free or not. Right. So that's going to be whether it's a CBD isolate, which is only CBD. They have broad spectrum, which means there is a hint of THC, THC but it's under it. the legal limit. Yeah. But if you were to take a drug test, you would test positive. Oh. And then a full spectrum means that you can do whatever they want. Like that would be a Colorado-based company because they don't have those THC laws that, that we have to abide by here. Oh, and Kansas that. can't have so full spectrum full products spectrum. Um, because we have not legalized the marijuana. Right. But you can order them and have them shipped in. No. You sure? Not well, supposed to. <laughs> not supposed to. You should talk about that a lot. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's company specific. Um, there is a lot of gray area in the hemp industry. Uh, that is what makes a lot of people weary of entering the, the cannabis space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's kind of a moving target with whatever the federal government regulates and then again at the state, state level yeah. is different. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's mainly, in my opinion, it's about you and your job. You know, they have CDLs. They cannot pass or that they cannot fail a drug test right. whether it's broad spectrum or full right. spectrum. Uh, I answer to myself, you know, so I don't, in a sense, don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's not really my thing, but um, you know, just showing the jobs is really the, the deciding factor for a lot of people. So, who had a question on here? Sorry. <laughs> Zoom. Yeah, the Zoom people. Good. Okay. So here's where it gets confusing. As if the last slide wasn't already kind of hairy. <coughs> the way you grow for 
what your, you have to know what your end product is for hemp before you even start. So you guys know a little bit about like corn and soybeans and things like that. You've got varieties and that's what they call like some like sandy soils, some like heavy soils, some can handle a lot of rain, some like drought, more drought conditions. Well, hemp, you have to know what your end product is. Because on the left, you see those CBD plants. That's what you guys see a lot of pictures of. You know, they're the bushy type substances, or bushy type plants. It's got big buds on them. Um, that's where your cannabinoids are, okay? We, as farmers and as large scale producers, our passion is in fiber and grain. We see that as scalable for Kansas. We see that as a great crop to rotate in farming systems that are already in place. Um, we do grow for CBD. Uh, we have 1,500 plants in 2019, 1,500 again in 2020, uh, and that is to feed our CBD line that we have. Um, but that was never our end goal. We truly believe in the future of fiber and grain and how we can integrate that into Kansas's economy. So that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Yeah. We can definitely touch on any CBD questions that you have, but my, our talk is gonna be mainly focused towards fiber and grain. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're at. And just as like a reference, um, the irrigation pipe here, uh, what is that, 14 feet tall? So, so these plants are anywhere from 10 to 12 feet tall wow. this year. So, and we'll touch on why, why they look different than your CBD plants because you're growing for a totally different purpose. So, 2020 South Bend Industrial Hemp's goals when we started this year was to produce a fiber and grain crop under an irrigated pivot. Uh, last year we tried it on some dry land ground, uh, but this year we wanted to put it under a pivot we wanted it to be our main focus for the year for what we were trying to accomplish. And the most important goal here is we wanted to utilize equipment that we already had. Um, we wanted, you know, you guys are learning or know about the ag industry. It's, there's not a huge profit margin at the moment. You know, prices aren't great. So in order to get farmers on board and to do this in the future, they're going to have to use equipment that they already have. You know, they don't need a half a million dollar harvester, et cetera. Like you can use the equipment that you've got. So that was, that was a big thing for us. And then as always, we are always pushing education and advocacy for this industry because there is so much misinformation out there. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know. My parents weren't really around hemp. That wasn't a thing. You know, it'd be more my grandparents, which have passed. So unless you're part of that older generation, You've never even experienced hemp because it's been illegal this whole time. Mm -hmm. So, we started planting in April of 2020. Um, it's very similar to other crops. We are a regenerative type farming system, so we use very minimal tillage. Uh, we love cover crops. We want to use um, as few of herbicides as possible to handle our weed control. Uh, but at the same time, we're not afraid to use chemicals, but we use them responsibly because you don't want um, resistant weeds and things like that that are going to hurt your farm later down the road. So we actually planted it on a half circle that we had grown teff grass last year, which is a high protein warm season hay. And so instead of taking that last cutting, we just let it die and then just let it kind of lay down throughout the winter. And when we came back in in April, we used our 30 inch Case IH early rise planter and planted it. Yes. Love the plug. Yes. <laughs> Case IH is all over this, so you're, you're ready. Um, this is the same planter that we put corn in the ground, soybeans in the ground, Milo. Okay? Now, we looked at plates because in the insides of these, that controls your rates, but by your seeds. Like, you know, you've got a corn plate and a soybean plate and a Milo plate and then, you know, whatever whatever type of plate that you want to put in there. Well, when we started doing seed comparisons and because of the precision planting and the capabilities at um, CanEquip for us to um, calibrate, we went with a Milo plate, okay? So 
We did have to purchase new Milo plates because ours were so worn. We just don't plant Milo that much, um, but overall, like if you were just a Milo farmer, you'd be fine. Like we could use that plate. So that's what we did. Um, you can see the seeds are pretty tiny over here. There was 41,129 seeds per pound. So these are very, very tiny seeds that, that you're putting in the ground. Depending on your variety will depend on your seed size. Um, but for us in this variety, this is what we are going for. You can see in the center picture, seed depth is extremely critical for success. This is the type of crop that likes to be planted at a quarter to a half inch at the deepest. Um, for reference, corn is an inch and a half to maybe two inches if you've got some dry conditions. Um, so seed depth, critical to success. The next thing that's going to be super critical is for you to get that crop up early. Uh, hemp has zero products that you can spray on it illegal, or legally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, corn's been through testing. That's what I do as a crop research scientist is get products and help develop that label for this area to go to the EPA to get registered. So mm -hmm. there's nothing on the market right now for hemp. So getting an early emergence, getting ahead of the crabgrass and the pigweeds are going to be critical for success. Um, this plant will compete but it can never truly outgrow that pigweed because pigweeds are just so aggressive. So that's kind of a little bit about our planting. The 2020 growing season. Just as there's no herbicides that you can put on the ground, there is also no insect control that you can spray. Uh, there is different organic products, uh, but for us, <laughs> we just, we didn't, we knew that going in that there was not gonna be much to spray. But in turn, we really don't know what insect pressures are here in Kansas that are going to target hemp. Um, you know, some plants like corn, or some insects like corn, some insects like soybeans, uh, you know, sorghum headworm isn't going to venture over to a corn plant because there's just, it's not interested in that. Um, because Kansas has only been grown since 2019, we really didn't know what insects to expect. So we walk the field every week. We have an agronomist on our team. He also walks the field every week uh, looking for different insect pressures, looking for different weed pressures or disease pressures, and, and just documenting. Lots of documentation. So that's what we did there. You can see the leaf size gets is pretty big on these plants. Um, I just thought it was a really neat thing. That is. Um, this crop can grow six inches in a week, no problem. <laughs> Um, oh. Grows wow. like weed, like that is not yeah. untrue. Very, very quick. Um, you can see our rows that we planted in, and just to kind of backtrack a little bit, um, canopy cover is extremely important for weed control because if the sun can't get to that plant, it can't grow. Um, so we actually took that 30 inch planter and planted our field twice. So we planted it moved over 15 inches and planted again. So instead of buying a special 15 inch planter, we just planted our field twice. <laughs> um, there are planters out there that have 15, 17 inch spacing, but again, that's a cost that we didn't want to incur. incur. So there's that. To the left, um, that is on July 5th-ish, um, and I'm about that's five big. nine. So it grows very, very quickly. Um, plant to watch. I, I felt like I'd go by in the morning and then I'd go by in the evening and I'd be like, oh, it's changed, it's growing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, fun to, it's fun to watch. Mm. Um, there, I'm just kind of standing in the middle of the field. You can see a couple pigweeds that have popped through. Um, it's a very windy day. Uh, it cracked me up because on the north side of the field, you can see the wheat waving, um, but I preferred the south half the field where the hemp was just moving around. It's it is pretty fun. So I have around nine thousand pictures of my on my phone and I'm pretty sure if seven thousand are hemp, fifteen hundred are my dog, and then there's like a few families and then <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so harvest. We've gone through the, the season. Uh, we fur fertigate, so through that center pivot, that's how we irrigated our crop. Uh, it got to approximately 10 to 12 feet tall. Um, you, you fertigate it the same as you would corn. Uh, that amount of nitrogen can go into this plant. It, it's just like another plant. Um, it really enjoys those nutrients. 
So we get to harvest. And part of Kansas's rules, so you notify the state at least 30 days prior to when you would like to harvest. They come out, test that plant, so they're cutting off um, eight inches of the top of the plant. They send that off to the uh, lab, and that's where you're gonna get your THC results. Mm. You know, They don't care about any of the other cannabinoids. They just wanna know that you are not growing marijuana. So they only do a THC test. So they have 10 days from the point of cutting to notifying us whether we passed or failed. Okay. If we were to fail, we can ask for a retest, um, but we've never had to do that. So that is good. Um, and the reason I think we're so successful in that is because we test on our own. Do we understand that this is an extra cost that we're taking on? Yes. But... The thought of having to burn a whole field and a whole year's worth of work because you didn't spend $65 on a test every mm -hmm. other week to weekly, to me that's crazy that growers just don't do that. When you look at the amount of money that you've dropped into seed, into fertilizer, into your time, $65. What do you do with that information? I mean, if your THC levels are going up, can you do anything about it? You call the state and you say, hey, get out here and come test my crop. And, and so then... They test it at the point that it's still legal. Okay, then can you, so then you, can you harvest it? And then you harvest it. it. Yeah, and then okay. you get to harvest it. But if you so wait to when you think it could be ready, like, to me, that would, that would give me a lot of anxiety. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. So there's no way to, like, make sure that the seeds you get will have that really low THC level? Yeah. Seed supply is extremely critical. And if you look at people in 2019 that are not growing this year, it's generally because they got burned, okay? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of not trustworthy people that entered into this industry. <laughs> they saw the big bucks, oh. and they saw you as someone that had never grown hemp before, yeah. and they were used car salesmen. They were very good at their oh. job. Mm. Um, we vetted everybody that we worked with, and we still got stung in a couple situations. Mm. On the flip side, we never invested more than we could lose. And so when people come to us and they ask for our advice, it's, it's funny to me because they're like, how much money can we make? And I'm like, <laughs> how much money can you lose? Like if yeah. everything goes yeah. wrong and you yes. get a bad seed or your seed goes hot, how much can you lose and still keep your farm open? Mm -hmm. That's where you start. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't love that answer, but <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be truth. honest. You know, it's, it's the, the truth. truth. Um, so where does the seed come from? Where does the seed come from? Yeah, where do you? Ooh, it depends on your variety, um, whether you're going for CBD. I mean, Oregon's really, Oregon and Colorado have really hit that CBD market. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for fiber and grain, Canada has been growing hemp for years. Um, but what is kind of interesting about this plant, longitude and latitude is extremely critical for how this plant responds. Um, the seed that we got, we were very happy with it. We saw it in the field the prior year. You know, it looked good. The germ test came back. This test from the state came back that it was good seed. And we've developed that relationship with that grower and that seed salesman. So he would stand by his product. Um, he had never seen this variety get over six and a half feet in Colorado because oh. of their altitude, because of their heat units. Oh. Well, it came to us, and we're, he's like, I've never seen plants this tall. Like, <laughs> never. He yeah. sent it up to Pennsylvania, different plant altogether. Hmm. Sent it down to Houston, the plant flowered at two feet and was done. Oh, wow. So, documenting your, your variety, finding what works with your area, um, I think that is going to be critical in the future. Like, K-State is doing a lot of testing, variety testing, et cetera. Um, we do variety testing here as well. Last year we grew X59. This year we grew A2. X59 flowered at two feet. It was a seed that had come from north, up north, and it, it was too hot here. Mm -hmm. Did not like it. Um, so, like I said, you know, we kind of got stung last year. We did not have a fiber crop that was harvestable. We ended up just disking it under because it wasn't worth harvesting because it was two feet tall. Mm -hmm. Fiber, you want long beautiful plants so. Mm. so that's kind of that so harvest rolls around we're like yes we're ready we've passed the state test um the motto for our harvest this year was 
change the plan, never the goal. Once the state gives you your pass test, you have 10 days to harvest. Or either A, the state comes out and retests you, which a lot can happen in the last 10 days of the plan, like if you're close to that mark. Um, so yeah, you've got 10 days to harvest everything, and either A, you burn it, and you just get under at the end of 10 days, or you have the state come out and retest. We don't want the state to come out and retest, because we we timed this, so our THC levels were 0.28. Mm. 0.3 is your limit. Because just kind of we've developed this bell curve. As your CBD levels rise, so do your THC levels. Mm -hmm. Or as your seed matures in this plant, because we're going for grain, as your seed matures, so does your THC levels. Mm. And so in order to maximize your production, you want to be as close to that 0.3% as you can. So we were very happy with our planning this year. You know, last year we harvested at 0.1% and we thought we were just killing it. And then, you know, we learned a little more and it was like, oh, we could have we waited another six weeks and really been okay. Um, so very happy with our CV, or with our THC test this year and where we harvested. Um, as farmers, we love to maximize our acres. You know, when people harvest wheat, they harvest the seed and then they come back and bale the straw. You're getting two crops out of the same acres. So we did the same. We tried to try crop it. So three commodities coming from our acre. The first one, this is a modified stripper head um, out of Colorado, Monta Vista, Colorado with formation ag. And so we actually go through the field and strip off the tops of the plants, okay? Because that's where your buds are, that's where your cannabinoids are. Yeah. Did we understand that this was not a CBD variety we were growing for? Yes. So we were not going to get high levels of THC. But if you're going to harvest anyway, you might as well take another commodity from that crop. That was our thought process. So we're like, okay. Richard built a dryer because you have to, you're harvesting these plants at approximately 80% moisture and you've got to dry that down to 10% or under. Otherwise it's just going to mold when you store it. Um, it's just like any other yeah. grain. That you're storing in a bin or you know food it has to be dry like clothes and stuff they start to get real weird if you put yeah. clothes away wet you know that's kind of the same concept so the middle picture um, is us putting the biomass that we have stripped from the plants into our dryer and then this is totally abandoning this plan after five days because it was like wow this isn't gonna work and we we harvested for seed so I'll kind of show you that here Change the plan, never the goal. We knew we wanted a harvested product. We knew we wanted at least two streams of income from this acres. We shot for three. We learned a lot. We won't shoot for three probably <laughs> next year. <laughs> so, Harvest was a character builder. I spent most of my time doing this. And I'm like, what broke now or what's not working now? Um, Richard spent most of his time up in the combine or on top of it, and what you don't see is I'm on the bottom side, like pulling plants out because the teeter house gets jammed up. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> if it was a time to not be married, that would have been it. <laughs> <laughs> we made it through, but yeah, no, anyway. <laughs> it, was, it was a character builder. Um, so. This is the plant stripping off the buds, or this is the harvester stripping off the buds into this wagon that is going to take it to the dryer. And, and at that point, we had a big commercial fan, pushes through, it's got heat, we're putting propane through, and you want, you want to dry that. Um, very neat machine, works very well out in Colorado. They, they tri-purpose their crop all the time. Um, that's where we had gotten the idea from. Uh, just didn't work for our area because our humidity is too high. Mm. We cannot dry it fast enough. Um, in this dryer, we filled it half full for capacity. Out there, they can do a full dryer in six hours. Oh. We did a half a dryer in three days and we still weren't happy with our moisture content. It's just, and, and you know, naturally it was like the dewiest days that of all year that we would need, need it to be dry. But that's just kind of how it works in eggs sometimes. Mother Nature likes to 
really challenge you and, and make that work. So, um, very cool that we started this or we tried it. We knew it didn't work for us. It could work for someone else, but we gained that experience. This is our drying limitations. Um, we've actually, we took a, a container and Richard built a false floor and then cut out holes for the fan and built all of that to be able to dry out of the tarp. Uh, you can see it being loaded on the left. You can see the amount of biomass that is coming out of this dryer. I mean, these are hundreds of thousands of pounds that we're working with on 55 acres. Um, much different than people that are harvesting for CBD, you know, that can hang 100 plants. You know, it's just a totally, we're focused on scalability. We want this to be a commercial crop. Um, and a lot of us just standing at the top of the dryer like, is it dry today? <laughs> nope. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that. So, change the plan, never the goal. We said, what are we going to do? We've got five days and we've only harvested 10 acres. And mm. we've got 55. Mm. Like, let's do the math. This isn't going to mm. work. Um, and because we were at that 0.28%, we knew we were probably going to be hot if the state came out again. Because another 10 days had, well, really mm. another 20 days had passed. Because the state takes 10 days to get your answer back. So 20 days have passed at this point. Um, so out the case 8010 something that we use every other um, use to harvest every other crop we had put on our draper head called can equip and was like hey what settings should we use so they called their Canada place or Colorado place I don't know where they called oh, yeah. they got us some settings um, and so we were able to to do this um, you can see us moving through the field we had the head all the way up um, because these plants were so tall in retrospect it probably hurt us a little bit that our plants were so tall because we ran a lot of extra material through the machine that if we were harvesting for pure seed we would have only let those plants get about six feet tall because that's where our head would have ran the most efficient mm. um, and you can control that by your nitrogen levels and your nutrients that you're feeding the plant like we were just pumping the nitrogen, you know, like we were doing the math and it made sense, but we were trying to get them as tall as possible. So um, you can see it, it's pretty clean going into the machine, which is good because again, the seed has to go to the dryer. Um, it is too wet to just put in the bin. Uh, so that's bad. Now we talked about the streams of revenue that you can get from the same acre. This is really where our, we get excited. This is all going to be swathed down, and we are going to round bale this, which we're actually doing today. Um, we're headed to the field after this to check on that. Uh, this has a process called redding, and it's going to lay in the field, and then it's going to go to a manufacturing plant once it's completed its process and it's baled. Okay? Uh, from there, that's where all your products or your plants going to be broken down so it can be made into products. Hemp. I could talk for hours about hemp and really only scratch the surface. Like, it's, it's such a cool plant. So that was our 2020. We still haven't totally finished it. Like I said, we're bailing. Um, and that's, we're excited to do that. So moving forward, 2021, it's like gonna make me start sweating. It gets me excited. I really love it. <laughs> we love being in, industry leaders. We truly believe in this crop and how it can be an alternative for, for farmers here. And we really see the future in the industry for the nation as a whole as fiber and grain. In terms of animal feed, uh, once the USDA has finished their testing, um, in terms of fiber production, because you can make over 50,000 different products from the hemp plant. Everything from as low as animal bedding to the interior of your Audi car, made from hemp. Ford is converting their interiors to hemp. Like anything made out of paper, plastic, or wood can be replaced with hemp. Oh, that's and good. it's so much more renewable. And so, like, yeah, that, like gets me jazzed up. Yeah. So, we thought we had our fiber sold, and our our guy ended up backing out because he lost his funding for a fiber plant. Mm. Um, so we put our heads together, and it was actually not the idea guy that came up with this. Like, 
It was actually something that I brought to the table. <laughs> we had talked about opening a fiber processing facility, uh, but it was kind of a few years down the road. Like we wanted to get a few more years under our belt. Um, but you know, timing doesn't always present itself in, in the way that you think it should go. Um, so we are actively pursuing opening a fiber processing facility here in Great Bend. Our target date is January 2021. Uh, we have our machine picked out that is going to decorticate. Uh, we are in talks with people that want to use the inside of the plant, which is a woody herd, which I could talk for hours just on breaking down the plant and the different products that you can get from the way this plant breaks wow. down. But um, there is some bioplastic facilities here in Kansas that are interested in our hemp. There is building associations. You can make houses from hemp, house shingles, house or hemp wood. Uh, insulation is huge because of the properties within this plant. And I would highly encourage you to just Google the plant. Like you could, it's, it's just a never ending rabbit hole. So that's what we're working on for 2021. Um, doing the whole bank game and and that's been what I've been working on um, through harvest and things like that. Uh, it slowed us down a little bit just because, I mean, the boys run the trucks and the combine and I'm in the green cart. And so, you know, you harvest all day and then you do paperwork for most of the night and then you do that until you like, you just can't see anymore. And then, yeah. <laughs> then you kind of crash for a few days and you do it all over again. So, and thanks to no rain delays, we actually harvested, I think it was like 42 days straight. Uh, from starting to hemp to putting our last bushel of grain in the bin. Uh, so it took a few days to recover from that one. <laughs> um, like I said, this fiber processing facility, we see this as a bottleneck of the industry. We have farmers that are willing to grow, We have, but there's no place to take them. You have these huge companies, they're not going to put manufacturing facilities in the ground because right now farmers aren't sure if they're going to grow. Farmers aren't going to grow unless they have a place to take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's chicken for the egg. So we were like, we can answer both those calls. We are a farmer and we want a manufacturing. We want a place to go with our crop. And just from the few things that we've worked out with contracts, we need 3,000 acres of hemp grown next year. Wow. How amazing can that be for Kansas farmers? I can help you down the road and you down the road and you down the road because I don't want to grow 3,000 acres of hemp. We don't want to grow 3,000 acres of hemp. But if I can pay you to do it and you know you have a place to go with your crop, that's reassurance for both you and me that I can supply my manufacturing facility and you can get paid for your crop. So that's really our end goal. We are farmers. We are here for farmers. We want to grow the Kansas economy. We want to grow farmers, Kansas farmers. We love all farmers, but we really love our Kansas farmers. Um, it's been pretty exciting. Uh, we're supported by the Kansas Department of Ag. They've come out and messed with us, or messaged, uh, or not messaged, just met with us. Um, the Kansas Department of Commerce has actually drove out to Great Bend and met with us as well. To me, that means a lot if they're willing to come to Great Bend, you know? There's a lot of people that are like, oh, come visit me, but when they come to us, that's, to me, very exciting. Um, but return on the investment per acre for the farmer is going to be huge, and what we see is exciting. Advantages for Kansas in terms of farming, minimal water needs, six inches or less. This is a crop that doesn't need a ton of water. Prefer sandy soils. Um, it's already shown to be successful. How many times do you see ditch wheat everywhere? So we know we can grow this crop. Um, and then Kansas was actually the largest producer of hemp before the prohibition. Uh, we believe our acres are attractive for scalability and the location of Kansas in terms of its centralness mm -hmm. throughout the, you know, and the highways that run through here, it's a great opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. um, how we advocate, this is something that I really, really believe in, transparency, social media. Uh, if you follow us on South Bend Industrial Hemp uh, for Facebook, I'm on there live all the time. The good days, the bad days, I share it all. Because uh, I really think being genuine yeah. is what uh, is going to move this industry forward. Uh, we love public speaking events. We've actually got to do things on the local, state, and national level. Uh, we do have an annual open house in July. That was very well received. I was so nervous because that was when the mask thing was going on and 
COVID and it was like, wow, we're either going to have nobody or everybody's so tired of sitting at home, we're going to have a really good time. <laughs> and so we were happy with everything. We did have a fall field day. We encouraged people to come out and see how it was harvested and what it looked like. And then we've actually um, gotten to do a show called Real Ag with PBS. Uh, we've been in oh. several different magazines, Hemp Grower. Uh, we have our first podcast on Tuesday. So that's pretty Great. cool podcast interview. And um, Eagle Radio, we do every the first Tuesday of the month, we get on and answer people's questions, talk about him, we choose a topic, and just kind of get to dive deeper. Um, it's been kind of cool to see our following grow in terms of that. Um, so yeah, big thank you to Tori for having us here today. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope it made sense. It is a very, very big topic, so we try to break down into specific chunks. And then most of the pictures were done by Kathy Rondo with Country Cottage Portraits, which again can be found on Facebook. So mm. if you need any ag pictures, that is like really her specialty. Oh, all these that pictures is were good. Amazing. That mm -hmm. was here. So that's great. Are there any questions? <laughs> Only question I have is, how is the fragrance after you've done the, the fragrance. separation, and <laughs> you're going to use it for? Fiber and smell. Fiber, yeah. Yeah, the fiber doesn't smell at all. Okay, I think it's no just buds. the top? No, just the buds. Okay. That's, I mean, if you get in your shoe and then you put it inside, it, you're going to smell it on your shoe. Um, but yeah. it's going to go, it's not, it's not going to stick around. Okay. Um, one thing that we really love about the grain side of things, uh, and again, this is a whole different topic that we could get on to, hemp parts, which are a great nutritional supplement. Uh, oh. just another avenue for this plant and a different product that can come. There's actually face creams and things like that because the oil is such has such good fats in it, omega threes, omega sixes for your heart, and then the moisturizers in terms of moisturizers is great for your skin. Um, so I love making stuff out More of hemp parts. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And so and these you are hemp parts. Great. Two balls. Thank They're you. great for smoothies on salads. You can do anything with that. I made oh. some banana bread last night. And yeah. That's on our Facebook page if you want to do that. And then he'll come back around in cards. So you guys are going to reach out. I love talking. So oh, I have great. Two yeah. questions on here. Um, can you talk about how you handle the market for your hemp? Does that, or what does the market look like for Kansas hemp producers? So the market is ever evolving. We actually, this, a week ago, about 10 days ago, uh, they launched this thing called Pan Exchange, so there's actually market boards, so you know the value of your crop. This is new. Up until this point, you were at the mercy of whoever you shook hands with at the beginning of the season. A lot of people got burned and did not get paid for their crop. Um, which again is why our fiber processing facility is extremely important to us. We can offer that security. Um, so. The hemp industry, in terms of the market, still evolving, and in Kansas, it's in its very infant stages. But we are working with um, people out of Topeka and other companies that are trying to step forward. So, I do have one, one last question. So, you said that when they come and test, okay, it has to be what 0.3% or whatever. Mm -hmm. What happens if it's more than that? I mean, maybe even a, a little, not really significant amount, but whatever. Do you really do you get in trouble? What you happens burn it. to you? Yeah. Uh, that's just I mean you don't get in trouble. They just make you burn. Over 0.5 percent, you are at a criminal offense. Uh -oh. So if you're from 0.3 mm. to 0.5 percent, they consider that like, and you only get one chance. Mm. Oh, so really? your second year, if you mess up again, then it's going to be a criminal offense. Oh. But here's what's wild to me: if you want to go smoke marijuana and get high. Those are like 20 to 30 percent THC. Oh. So really, like, what is 0.5? Yeah, yeah. Point you're five. right. It's a headache. That's yeah. 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 So uh, along that same line, you said that it's been 20 days mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you went in to finish the harvest. Did they have to come out and retest? Did you have to retest it? Were you worried that you were going to be over that 3 percent? I mean, I would have assumed we would be over that 0.3% uh, because of the graph that we've developed the last two years. And we're constantly adding data points. We test every week. Um, oh. You know, once it starts flowering, we'll test every other week. And then once we start seeing those numbers rise, we're looking every week. And so we're building this curve. Mm -hmm. um, but you have 10 days. So really, as long as our goal is to finish within that 10 days, okay. no matter what. Okay. 
So because we didn't want to retest. So Kansas doesn't care because you finished it within the you 10 days. You got 10 days. Okay. So, yeah, so if we would have <clears throat> passed the 10 days, we would have had to retest. Okay. Do they come back out and make yes. sure you've done it in 10 yeah, days? Yes. They check. Post okay. Post. And uh, you actually yeah. submit your GPS coordinates and they fly it to Katie at oh. Oh, okay. oh. the Kansas Department. Yeah. The police, they fly that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. can you, once they come out and test, can you start harvesting before you get the results back? Not so there's anyway. that like 10 day, you no. can't do anything. You just okay. sit there and... Get ready to go. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of like when you get to the start line, you know. Uh huh. Stay there. Uh -huh. so, yeah, okay. that's kind of what we did there. No crop insurance, correct, for this type of crop? This was crop insurance was introduced this year. Um, but what's pretty crazy is in terms of crop insurance, if you know a little bit about that, you have to have five years worth of data, mm. and if you don't, you do the county averages. Oh. There's the what year. county has grown for five years? <laughs> so they put their own numbers in there. Mm. And so oh. when you started, I met with several insurance agencies, and we kind of communicated because we're very detailed about you know our finances and things like that. And when you ran the numbers, it was like this covers one seventh of my seed cost. Like it's not oh. even worth oh. the time it is for me to fill out this paperwork. That's mm. part of our that. issue with the processing facility, where we you have to have a contract signed for your crop. An end result, so to be also, eligible, to be eligible for, for insurance. insurance. Yeah. That oh. way, with our facility, once we have our facility up and running, we can sign a contract with growers, and that's one more step they have for insurance. Oh, oh yeah. good. Every time it hailed, or when we have that 100 mile an hour wind, I was like, You're panicked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like it passed, and I'm like, Can we go look at the field? I just need to know. Like, I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So, on a scale of um, crop, um, like uh, difficulty to grow and the investment and all that, you know, where does this range with wheat and milo and all these other things we've talked about today? Is it more labor intensive? Is it more costly? Is it? It depends. If you're on CBD, you're looking at a lot more labor. Okay, you're going to have to do hand weeding. A lot of people hand harvest. Um, mm. Oh, wow. We wow. hand harvest our 1500 plants because it's really not economical enough for us to get machinery for 1500 plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. um, you can use that stripper head, but again, if you've got big bushy plants, that stripper head isn't going to work as efficiently as a hand harvester. So your labor expenses uh -huh. are going to be a lot higher, which is why we want to see this fiber side. In terms of growing, it's still a plant, and it continues you know, just as corn has evolved, and we've learned what nutritional requirements are needed to produce maximum corn for your acres. It's the same thing we're doing with hemp. Um, we just the last time any research was done on hemp was by K State in the 1970s. Well, how has farming practices changed the last 50 years? Yeah, really, all not all of that data <coughs> is old, but a lot of it is. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the final question I have, uh, just to keep us going on time schedule, is do you guys ever do tours? If so, how would they get a hold of you? And Yes. Okay, so he's going to hand out cards if he hasn't already, but uh, southbendindustrialhemp.com, you can find us. Our Facebook page, South Bend Industrial Hemp, or our Instagram Thank page, you. South Bend okay. Hemp. Uh, just reach out. We love people coming out and looking at the farm, um, and then we'll have our open house next July. And I have all of their contact information, like I said, with everything else. I'll just keep sending it out, and I'll send out the links to the Facebook pages. And, and uh, you can also buy their products. Um, oh, yeah. So we didn't even touch. We've got saps. We've got oils. I'm getting ready to launch a bath line in the next 30 days or so uh, that has your CBD products in. But that was not the rabbit hole we were So, yeah. Yeah. Right. I have lots of everything, and I just really yeah. highly encourage you guys to. to uh, this is a really interesting crop. I know it is. This process with my husband being uh, able to help out and, and learn a lot with them, I've learned he'll come home and tell me. Oh, yeah. So, guess what happened today? <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Um, I am. Thank you.